Thank you, Olivia and Amy. They did a wonderful job, didn't they? Amen. It does my heart good to see young people involved in, in the service and knowing that uh, we can love the Lord at any age and be involved. Isn't that great? Yes. It's, um, it's an unusual thing that I experience when I have opportunities to be able to speak. Um, I hope I'm the only one that is a little bit happy that the pastor couldn't be here this week. <laughs> and I know that everyone misses Mike, and, uh, but I just uh, enjoy it so much to be able to be with you. And so uh, this Sabbath, we'll, we'll have a wonderful time uh, studying together and, and finding some wonderful new uh, thoughts that may lead us in some uh, wonderful wonderful experiences with Jesus Christ. But you know, I found that I can do very little on my own. I need the Holy Spirit. So if you would, I'd like you to bow your heads with me and invite them into your heart today. Jesus, we thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to be able to spend time with you, uh, communicate, um, uh, praise and, uh, and grow in what you have uh, left us to be able to understand in your scriptures. And so we ask today that to have our experience completely fulfilled, we need your Holy Spirit. And so I ask for myself that you would send your Holy Spirit and give me the gifts of, of tongues to be able to communicate your message well. And I ask that you also give us the, the gifts to implement what we learned today. Carry it home with us and share it with others. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Well, Pastor asked me if I would have the third sermon in a series that is being done that, um, that speaks to a, a specific um, concept or word, if you would. He asked me to center my sermon on the word patience. Now, I thought when I first got this, if you talk to my wife, she would say, well, that's going to be a challenging one for you. <laughs> and indeed it is. Uh, patience has not always been my, my best attribute. In fact, um, a number of years ago, probably 20 years ago, I decided well, I, that I would, um, I would uh, start uh, putting special emphasis on learning how to speak Spanish. It happened one morning when I was teaching uh, high school Bible, and off to my left in the back sat a group of Spanish-speaking students and they would chat among each other in Spanish, to which I was sure they were talking about me, <laughs> which was totally wrong, it turned out. They were discussing other things of greater importance, but I decided at that point, I'm gonna learn Spanish so that I know what they're saying. Well, I've been working on it for 20 years, but in the first, but, and, and it keeps going and going and going, and I, and I have some improvements, in some areas, in some areas, I have some lack. But I remember in my great enthusiasm to be able to speak good Spanish, um, I accepted the responsibility to go to Tijuana every uh, week and go to a hospital that, um, that uh, was mostly, mostly onco oncological, and they had people who had cancer from all over the world, and they were trying some different types of treatments on individuals, so they came all over the world to do that. Well, um, driving into Tijuana at night, going through La Mesa and up to La Colonia and dropping down over the hill into Las uh, Playas to be able to go into the hospital uh, was always kind of a challenge. I memorized certain things if I got stopped um, by someone who was an officer 
I had memorized, soy un pastor, soy muy pobre. For those of you that are Spanish speaking, <laughs> you'll, you'll know the necessity of those, those particular words. And um, so I remember going up to the watch gate at the hospital and thinking that I was um, all prepared for this and the man came out and, and I said to him, yo quiero, quiero visitar los um, paciencias. Well, paciencias doesn't mean people uh, that are patients. It means people that have patience. <laughs> and so he just looked at me like, what on earth? And he asked me several, several times. When I went home, I began asking the students, how do you say uh, patience as people? And they said, pacientes. And uh, I think that I'm correct on that. And, um, and instead of saying paciencias, uh, which was patience in a different way. Sometimes words can get you in trouble, can't it? When you get uh, and say the wrong things, uh, it can be very em embarrassing. But patience is uh, something that I think is a wonderful gift. It's not a commodity, is it? Often when we hear uh, sermons, we leave and we say, I've got to have some of that. Where do I get it? You know, kind of a thing. But in reality, patience is not something that we can buy or uh, purchase somewhere. It can't be something that we read and put together different ways to make it work. Patience is something that has to grow upon us. I did a little word study into the concept of, of patience and, and uh, even got out the uh, Greek lexicon. It's been a long time since I pulled that one out and uh, began looking up words and found out that in the Bible, there are several words that go along together. One is patience, one is endurance, one is long sufferings, and one is perseverance. Now perhaps you would think that those words are greatly different, but in the Bible, in talking about relationship building in patience, they have a lot of overlap. Now, when you're young, you have a lot of endurance, don't you? Very little patience. My parents tell me that I was a very impatient young man and that I had a lot of endurance when it came to crying. But um, the reality is when I got a little older, I found out I had in my teens a lot of endurance, but still very little patience. Now that I'm older, I found out the hard way that patience I have more of and endurance I have hardly any. <laughs> the other day, I decided to cross the street where I, shouldn't, where I shouldn't cross. I got in the middle and realized I, had, I better hurry up or I was going to be run over. And the next thing I realized was that I was running. Now I couldn't even believe that I could still run. <laughs> I got to the other side and spent the next three days saying, I can still run. <laughs> but not very far, because I don't have much endurance. But I can, I can certainly be patient about, about it. So lots of us experience the difference between these kind of words. But it is patience that as we grow through life, we really desire. Patience is described by one individual is remaining in a state of emotional quietness in the face of difficult times. Let me say it one more time. Remaining in a state of emotional quietness, emotional quietness in the face of difficult times. Well, that doesn't come all that easy, does it? Especially the interesting thing I've found in life 
is sometimes it's easier to achieve that with people you don't know than the ones that you're closest to. And that's the challenge we have laid before us. But the good news is we have someone helping us achieve that through life. Patience isn't a commodity, commodity, we can't buy it. There are no pills to supply it, but it does grow in you as you see it in others and, to, and desire to be a part of them. I personally believe that it's something that the Holy Spirit can help you grow in your life, and that growth is accelerated in your life when you hit really hard times. No pain, no gain. <laughs> it's been a number of years, but when I was in high school, I was plagued, and this is hard for you to believe today, when I look in the mirror, I look at myself and I say, how did it happen? But when I was in high school, I weighed 123 pounds. Six foot tall and 123. I loved to surf in high school, but I hated to be seen by anybody I knew. For in a swimsuit, if I turned silent, sideways, people didn't even see me there. Well, things have changed, haven't they? I didn't wear suits through most of the summer. And when I went through my closet, somehow, in this dry summer heat, all my jackets shrunk. <laughs> That's a little hard to believe, isn't it? But God can grow you in the area of patience, and that's much more desirable than the way I've been growing lately. Let's take a look at Romans chapter 5. This, to me, the first part of Romans it's just all good news. This is a chapter that really brought me to an understanding of the good news of Jesus Christ and the gospel itself and how it really works in your life. I thank the girls for reading these, but I'd like to read them one more time for you just so you can see a few things that I point out along the way. Therefore, Romans 5, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith. Friends, the interesting thing you'll see in these verses here is to understand how you begin to assimilate patience in your life, you have to start somewhere. And the place the Gospels tells us that we start is in faith in Jesus Christ. And so it says, therefore, having been justified by faith, in other words, knowing that no longer are you labeled sinner for life with no chance of a future with Jesus Christ, you do have a future because of what he did for you. You are justified by faith. We have peace with God. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't understand the concept of of his grace at all. And I had faith growing in me, but I didn't understand his grace. And so I couldn't understand what scripture was always talking about in peace. Because in my life, I had constant turmoil. I was trying to be good enough for God, but I could not achieve that. So I never found peace at all. It wasn't until I understood the gospel fully that I began to understand that when you understand that your faith is based on what Jesus has done for you, that you can experience peace. And then you have not only faith that is growing in you, and you have peace growing you in you, and it says with God, with God, peace with God, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. Now you might say, well, what does that have to do with patience? 
It's the steps that God grows you through to get to that point here on earth. The interesting thing, you haven't purchased it, you haven't bought it, you haven't claimed it as a commodity, but it begins to grow within you when you see that Jesus Christ died for you, that the Father provided you faith, and that faith is growing within you. And he's given you peace in your life, knowing that your future is, is secure within what he does, as long as you continue to claim him. And then it says in verse through, 2, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace. What he did for us. Now you've got justified. You've got faith. You've got peace. And you've got faith again. And then you've got grace. And, and it says, obtained, uh, whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand and we exalt in the hope of the glory of God. So you got a full package there, folks. <laughs> Living without peace, living without hope, God comes to you. You see that you would like to have him in your life. He comes into your life. He justifies you so that you no longer are responsible for what you've done. He takes that responsibility and he begins growing you in faith, gives you peace and continues to, to develop you to where you find yourself having hope in the future and knowing that you'll be a part of his glory when he comes again. And then in verse 3 he says, And not only this, but we also exult, we also praise him, we're also excited in our tribulations. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That is like the monkey wrench that went into everything. <laughs> I think to myself, why? I've been working my whole life not to have tribulations. I like the peace part. I don't like the tribulations. But the reality, it says here, that he will take us in step by step and grow us to the place where we can even say, I'm happy with God when things are tough. And when you feel like the clouds are going to roll over you and just completely smother you, you don't have to let them because God is there saying, you know what? I'm in control. You can rely on me. You know that I have paid the price for your salvation. You've grown to see me in life. And I am going to take care of you. And so you find yourself going to him when hard times come, but confidence in that he can do it for you and get you through the other side. And it, when you get through the other side, you'll be able to say, glory to God, isn't he good? <laughs> isn't he good? You know, the interesting thing is that first, we obtain our understanding of what he did for us by believing that he did this for us. Faith in him has begun. Then secondly, we begin to understand that his grace is directed toward us, towards us. It's for us. And we don't have to um, grapple with not being good anymore, not being good enough. Thirdly, we begin our beginning, we begin our beginning of believing in that what he has prepared for us, the heavenly kingdom, is all ours, and we exult in this great hope. When I think 
of patience, which these verses begin to point out how it is created. Verse 4 says, And perseverance, getting towards the last, proven character, and proven, and, and proven uh, character, uh, the second time is mentioned, it, it brings hope. And um, the reality is, loved ones, that um, all these things he set in place begins to change us inside and we find that what we thought was impossible before comes naturally due to his presence within us. I haven't had the wonderful uh, privilege of serving as associate pastor for family ministries and young people in the Arlington Church many years ago. And my senior pastor was, his name was L. Calvin Osborne. There may be somebody here old enough to remember Uncle Cal. Cal was the senior pastor of the La Sierra University Church for 16 years when I was a teenager. That was a long time for a pastor to serve in one place in the 60s. <laughs> and um, he served there for 16 years. And, um, and then it was time to move on. And he was assigned to the Arlington Church. Now, if any of you have been to Riverside, you'll find that La Sierra's just used to be just kind of out in the country a little bit further from Riverside and that Arlington was a little closer and it was a little less country than, than La Sierra was. Now it's all Riverside and there's no country left. <laughs> and Uncle Cal accepted the call to go to the Arlington Church. Well, it was back in the time when the conference president would come to the church board and say, you lucky people, here's who you get to be your next pastor. There were no search committees, there weren't things like that. So Uncle Cal was introduced to the church. Well, the Board of Elders weren't very happy about that because he had been right next door for 16 years. They thought that they wanted to have somebody new and exciting and bring somebody in from some other place and they were afraid of a lot of things. But Uncle Cal was there. I came along and we uh, had a great time together and I really appreciate his ministry. But what I learned from him was all about patience. The Board of Elders were upset that he was there for about 13 years because um, Uncle Cal had a lot of patience. And I can remember sitting on the church board and having the, that same old story talked over and over and over again about we wanted somebody new and fresh and we got somebody from somebody else, someplace right next door and their desires for Uncle Cal to move on and go someplace else so they could get somebody new. The reality was that church grew and grew and grew under his leadership. No one was as loved as Uncle Cal. Everybody loved Uncle Cal, except the Board of Elders. And, um, and I remember going to staff meetings after those rocky things, those meetings and the board me meetings, and, and I can remember the board meetings themselves. And I remember one time at a board meeting, he stood up, people just upset about the fact that he was there. And he said, um, friends, I want to tell you, I've thought of thousands of ideas in my life to change things. And most of them failed. But I think it's time for a new idea. <laughs> and he never responded to the criticism. He never, ever um, protected himself by saying, but you guys, or whatever. He just came up 
with a new idea and a new direction to go. When we came to staff member meetings, I remember he would, he would uh, talk about what new directions we should go, what we should do. He never complained about the board. He never complained about individuals. And he never complained about us. We could tell when he up, was upset, not by what he did, but what he would ask us to do. He would say, guys, I need you to go out and do more visiting. And suddenly we would have the church divided up and we'd be out there visiting up a storm for Uncle Cal, you know, and stuff like that. But he exemplified the greatest amount of patience I've ever seen in my life. When he was 92 years old, he was officiating at a funeral. I came in, sat down with Uncle Cal, and he said, Cousin Jeff, how you doing? <laughs> and I said, I'm doing fine. How are you doing, Uncle Cal? And he said, I'm doing fine. And then he sat there for a moment, and he turned to me, and he said, I think it's all I think it's all about relationship. It's all about relationship. And I thought about it. And I came to the conclusion, as I was studying today, that when it comes to the concept of patience, it's all framed in the area of relationship. You don't get to and the Bible, when, it, when, you, when you read about the different words that describe the same thing as patience, it's always aimed at relationship. God's relationship with mankind or mankind's relationship with God. And it cannot play out in our lives without relationship. And the tumult and tribu tribulations that come along the way um, are a part of the growth experience how we meet them with him decides how we grow in patience along the way. The good thing is, is he comes along and he continues to give us hope. Let's turn to chapter 8 over here. You're not in this by yourself. This doesn't happen without, without him. Verse 24, for in hope we have been saved, but hope that is uh, seen is not hope. For why does one hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see with perseverance, we wait eagerly for it. And in the same way, the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. I, I, don't, I, I could spend a whole sermon on that one. <laughs> so interesting, with groanings too deep to be heard even. Um, and, he, and he searches his heart, and he who searches his heart knows that the mind of the Spirit is because he, inter he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Perseverance in difficulties is accomplished because the Holy Spirit is with you the whole time. He's facing the issue with you. He's influencing you. He's taking care of you. He's watching over you. And he's anxious to see how that grows in your life. I may have told you this story, but when I was pastoring another church, we had a member who was convicted in his heart that God had called him to be the prophet who sits on the wall and watches down and judges everybody and tells them what they're doing wrong. It got kind of out of hand. We had potlucks at people's homes and he would go and go through their, their refrigerator and their pantry 
and cupboards and come to the board meeting the next week with accusations of what he found in their pantries and stuff like that. It just got totally out of hand. And um, I got fearful for my life. He got to the place. I knew that I was afraid that he was coming unhinged and he would show up at my house some night and shoot me down. <laughs> and, it during, and we spent a lot of time with the Board of Elders praying for this individual. And their, their exhibit of patience with me is what got me through that. One Saturday night at a church business meeting, we'd invited the church that rented from us to make a presentation. They would like to, they'd grown so large they wanted to use our sanctuary. And he was a part of a group that was opposing that. While, just before I introduced them to speak, he jumped up, walked forward to me in front of everybody, took a brick that he was holding in his hand, held it up above my head. <laughs> and I thought to myself, what do I do? Well, I didn't do anything. The elders saw what was happening, rushed forward and stopped him, and held him from doing what he at least was exhibiting what he was going to do. Afterwards, people came to me and said, how could you exhibit such patience? I wanted to say, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> I didn't know how to react. I wanted to say that, and I realized, though, that the Holy Spirit had stepped in and actually created, with that situation, a learning experience for the church body. Because the church body was very much divided over what was going on, and they could not see whether he was a true prophet or not a true prophet. And that evening it became very, very clear. Patience is something that God works through you to create in, in the spirit. He can do that for you. He can make that happen for you. Here's the good news, the 28th verse in the book of Romans, chapter 8. And we know that God causes all things to work together for the good for those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. <laughs> all things, the tribulations, the difficulties, all that kind of stuff, if you just keep trusting him, faithing, holding on, then you know he does his work. And that's when the patience is grown, the perseverance is grown, the endurance is established, the long suffering begins to to happen in your life. It's not because you set out to accomplish it, it's because you set out to learn to trust Jesus Christ. May each one of you today, who are loved so deeply by Jesus Christ, loved so deeply by God, who are cherished so deeply by God, May you experience his presence in your life, be able to see his character and desire it for yourself, and live in peace under the knowledge that all things can come together for good through him. May you experience that. Pray for that in your life. Let's pray. Our dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love and caring. The love that walks through us through life, the, wa the love who, could, who um, gives us peace in life, the, the love that establishes faith in our life, the, li the love that will carry us to grow us into perseverance and patience, long-suffering. We thank you that you've given your Holy Spirit to accomplish this in our lives. We look at you 
we walk with you in thankful hearts, knowing you will accomplish this in, in us too. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.